Good afternoon and welcome to the sixth and last presentation on Arthur the Once and Future King. Just now, I happened to reread the course description in the ILR bulletin. I was not surprised to find that Nancy has done exactly what she said she would do, which was, over the next six weeks, we will explore the growth, evolution, and impact of Arthur's legend. His story has been adapted, adopted, and changed to reinforce social norms and to create them. From the earliest mention in 6th century Welsh poetry to 21st century films, Arthur and his court have inspired storytellers, artists, and their audience. And then she went on to mention there would be a film each week uh, to complement the lecture. So thank you, Nancy, for weaving together a wealth of historical and cultural material to help us understand why Arthur is such an enduring figure uh, to this present day. Thank you, Sheila. Part of the day is getting the microphone set properly. Um, I was thinking about today and the fact that it's the last class of this series and I remembered the very first time I came to the end of a semester, I was much, much younger then, and I looked around the room at the 18, 19 year olds sitting in the class. This was uh, first year English, and many of the students were from STEM, clear over on the other side of campus, only taking it because it was a required course. And I looked up and I looked at these kids that I'd gotten to know so well over the course of the semester, and I just immediately burst into tears because I was sure I'd never see them again. And it scared the daylights out of them. Mama, is you, are you okay? Anyway, I'm fine, you're fine, and uh, if you've enjoyed this semester, you'll have a chance to see me again in the fall when I will be doing a course very, very different on Hopi myth. Hopi are a group of people who live in the, uh, well, what is now the state of Arizona, but wasn't always. So, back to Arthur. I think I need control. No. So, what does Arthur have to offer to us today? I think there are a number of things that we get from these stories. There's pleasure in the familiar. There's comfort. It's a connection to the past, even our own personal past of our childhoods. Uh, there's a sense of the world made right by people doing the right thing, which is one of the continuing themes through Arthur and his stories. There's also the excitement, the challenge, the daring and adventure in these stories. And finally, we get to journey into a world where the right thing to do is obvious, which is something I really wish we had here. The Arthurian legend of the 12th, 20th, and 21st centuries is a remarkable, malleable body of material capable of being expanded, contracted, radically changed in form to fit the design of an author or the fickle tastes of the public. Since 1900, and far more so since 1950, Arthurian legend has been shaped into social and political satire, comedy, science fiction and fantasy, feminist fiction, mysteries and thrillers, comic books, and more than a few examples of pure silliness, as those of you who were here on Saturday saw with Monty Python, or if you're more of the formal stage, you might have seen Spamalot. 
Further, there are many retellings of the traditional stories, most of them inspired by Mallory and written either for adults or more often today for teens and children. These modern narratives have a wide variety of fidelity to the Arthurian period, whether that period is assumed to be the sub-Roman Dark Ages Britain or more often the High Middle Ages. It's not surprising that Arthur in his modern incarnations is most popular in literature written in English. Not only was he known as the King of the Britons, but more importantly, the Mort d'Arthur of Sir Thomas Mallory was the most influential late medieval text. However, these two facts are not enough to explain Arthur's great hold on the imagination of the English-speaking people. After all, the great flowering of Arthurian literature in the centuries following William the Conqueror, uh, the flowering occurred on the continent with France in the lead and other languages close behind. So why did Arthur, and I know I've been asking this question all the way through this class, I'm still not sure I know completely. Why did Arthur continue to be a British English hero? His is the history we would have liked to have had, and that's a verb tense I love, we would have liked to have had this history. Over the years, he has become, he and his tales, have become embedded in our cultural DNA. Arthur was born in sub-Roman Britain, the general period. Oh, yep. That's what Arthur might well have looked like when he first appeared on the scene. He was a hero from the very beginning. It was he who killed thousands of Anglo-Saxon invaders all by himself. He was the one to whom other warriors were compared. The yardstick, the epitome of the hero, heroic warrior. But, at the same time, he was also human. Born of deceit and adultery, betrayed by his wife and his best friend, and killed by Mordred, who is sometimes described as his nephew and sometimes his son. Now, both of these roles relationships are very important in the Celtic tradition. A sister's son is the only one a man can be positive is related to him by blood. And this relationship is privileged in the Celtic stories. Remember, Arthur is Cullock's uncle. Furthermore, almost every culture prohibits killing one's own son. But Arthur's forced to do it. This mixture of untarnished hero with base human actions and emotions is, I believe, one of the reasons, the main reason possibly for Arthur's longevity. I mean, just a plain old do-good hero isn't very exciting, and villains get boring after a while. It's that fine line mix his story is not just one of brilliant successes, but in the background lurks treachery, incest, and failure. A complex mix that makes him fully human. Mordred is the figure in these tales that has undergone the most transformation. In Welsh tradition, there's no hint that Mordred is a dishonest traitor. The Annals Cambrai records the Battle of Camlan, in which Arthur and Mordred both fell in the year 537. But it includes no details describing whether the two fought against each other 
whether they fought together, whether they were related, or what the circumstances of the battle were. They just both died. Geoffrey of Monmouth first makes Mordred the traitor, causing the downfall of Camelot and the death of Arthur. The villain is not as yet Arthur's nephew, but at this point, he's still the youngest son of King Lot and Anna, who's King Arthur's half-sister. In Geoffrey's work, Mordred fills the adulterous role that Guinevere and Lancelot will eventually play. While Arthur is off fighting the Roman general Lucius, Mordred marries Guinevere, <laughs> marries, and attempts to claim Arthur's throne. Arthur returns from France to fight a series of battles, and the last tragic battle is the one at Camelon. Medieval French authors, of course, are the first to introduce the incest factor. In the Vulgate cycle, the massive collection of French Arthurian texts that served as one of Sir Mark Thomas Mallory's sources for the Mort d'Arthur. Two conflicting stories of Mordred's incestuous conception appear. In one version, in one version of Mordred's birth, Arthur and his sister, the beautiful wife of King Lot of Orkney, commit incest unknowingly, discovering only afterwards that they are brother and sister. In another, Lot's wife has been the object of Arthur's affections. And in a scene strangely reminiscent of the conception of Arthur himself, she is deceived by Merlin into thinking that he is her husband, Lot. The result of their union is Mordred. <laughs> the Vulgate authors relate Quote, would have been a very handsome person and had a handsome face if his demeanor had not been so wicked. Thomas Mallory's account of Mordred's treachery is the most well-known and influential version of the story. Mallory gives us a reason for Mordred's hatred of Arthur in an episode called The May Day Massacre, in which Arthur having listened to a prophecy of Merlin that the child who would cause his and his kingdom's downfall will be born on May Day. Arthur decides to kill all the children born on that day. Now there are echoes of Herod here as Arthur collects all the children born throughout his kingdom on May Day the 1st of May, a very important day in the Celtic calendar, uh, some of them as young as four days old. I'm not quite sure how they arrived at that figure, but anyway, Arthur put them all or had them all put on a ship and set it adrift in the seas to make sure that the child who would cause his downfall would die. However, Life never goes according to plan. His plan fails when the ship breaks up on some rocks, killing all of the children except Mordred, who is rescued and fostered until he turns 14. After that, he disappears out of the stories, occasionally appearing for tournaments, but does not figure importantly until he joins Agravain in a plot to reveal Lancelot and Guinevere's love affair. Mallory emphasizes Mordred's treacherous and underhanded nature by telling us that Mordred kills Sir Lamorak by stabbing him in the back. And in a fight outside Guinevere's bedchamber, he survives by running away. Run away, run away. Monty Python, he takes over every once in a while. In the ensuing fight, after Lancelot rescues Guinevere from being burned at the stake, I've never been able to understand why, if there's adultery going on, the wife is burned at the stake, 
And the man has said, naughty, naughty. But that's the way it was back then. Um, after Lancelot rescues Guinevere, Mordred attempts to take over the kingdom while Arthur and Gawain are away at the siege of Benwick. Mallory's detail follows in the description of the fatal wounding of Arthur in the death of his treacherous son. And when Sir Mordred felt that he had his death wound, he thrust himself with all his might up the handle of King Arthur's spear. And you can see in this picture that Mordred is pushing himself up the spear driving it deeper and deeper into his body so that he can reach Arthur to give him a death blow. That's anger. Mallory's detail follows in the description of the fat fatal wounding of Arthur. I'm sorry. For an, this is, an, according to one art critic, an excellently gruesome illustration of this final fight uh, by Arthur Rackham. But his death was not the end of Arthur, Arthur's death. We were not willing to let go of him. More quests, more nights, more complications, and more additions to the story. It's like greedy kids. Arthur became the perfect king surrounded by fabulous knights, but then one of them betrayed him and brought down the whole shooting match. We are constantly rebuilding, recreating the myths, the histories, the history that we would like to have had. And if we repeat it enough times, it becomes true. There are many examples of this in our elementary school history books. The happy slave living with the benevolent slave owner. The first Thanksgiving. The empty land in the new world just waiting for Europeans to colonize it. So with Arthur. He was the heroic warrior who almost defeated the Saxons, the just and victorious king who set an example, the monarch to whom other knights gravitated. Now the 21st century, 20th and 21st, has given rise to a simultaneous explosion of technology and Arthurian stories of the king and his knights, damsels in distress, have you ever noticed how frequently the word distress follows damsels? We don't ever hear about damsels in charge or damsels writing a book or damsels organizing a quest. No, they're always in distress. So some knight could come charging out and rescue them. Now there's one exception to this that I know of. It's a wonderful little book called The Paper Bag Princess. And she refuses to take the girl's part. And she has a boyfriend who's a kind of a coward. And he tells her that there's this horrible fire-breathing dragon. And she says, that's OK. I'll save you. So if you know somebody in the, oh golly, 5 to 10 age group, it's a perfect book. The princess rescues the prince from the dragon. We also see the same sort of thing in Marion Zimmer Bradley, among others, uh, writers, female writers, who bring the women's stories to the fore and tell us what the women were doing while the men were off hacking each other to bits. Arthurian tales in the 20 and 21st century have exploded into all the new media. Radio, film, internet, comics. 
while, of course, remaining in books. And I went back and looked, and there's only one of those technologies, I mean, if you leave books aside, that was around when we were young. They've all come into being during our lifetime. King Arthur and his knights, damsels in distress, continue to be featured in popular culture. But no longer do we have the dreamy, attenuated images of the Victorian era as you see here. Oops. But we're back to seeing knights in shining armor battling against enemies and women beginning to take their place on the stage. This explosion of interest and enthusiasm for Arthur and his knights has not been limited to popular culture, but has continued to be a subject of academic inquiries, abetted by the internet capabilities, unimaginable, I wrote even 50 years ago, but really unimaginable even 30 years ago. From the comfort of their own home, scholars can now examine exact replicas of the manuscripts without having to travel to England and wait for the opening hours at the British Museum. They can compare language, estimate date of composition, and do all of the things that fascinate scholars without having to leave their recliner. For example, the earliest known manuscript, the one most folks think is the one the printer Caxton used, and he made changes to Mallory's manuscript while he was setting it in type. Uh, after he finished with it, the manuscript, it somehow made its way to Winchester College, where, like Arthur, it lay quietly sleeping until it was discovered in 1934, and it resides today in the British Museum. Some of these research tools that scholars have today include two massive databases. Well, when I last taught at the University of Maryland 20 years ago, there were two. And I probably should have gone back and changed it, but I didn't. I went online to get the IRL, IR, URL for these two databases, because I was going to give them to you. And my brain exploded. There are no longer two, but two hundreds of databases. Some are very specialized. Uh, there's one called Arthuriana, which is only Arthur, uh, some deal exclusively with handwriting of the 12th century, I kid you not, and there are thousands and thousands of articles. Project Gutenberg is a library, it's one of the first, library of over 70,000 free ebooks. They've copied and digitized a multitude of works that are out of copyright. Now they're several hundred years old, so of course they're out of copyright. A small army of scholars and trained volunteers have read these manuscripts, translated them into modern English, and provide a transcript of this. Their work allows you to read the 12th century romances of Chrétien de Troyes in modern English. Other websites offer different translation, and one is faced with a surfeit of choice. Of course, what we've lost with this armchair research is the smell of old books, the dust, the feeling of connection, the smoothness of the covers the calfskin covers, the way the ink stays clear on the vellum over centuries. 
If you'd like to read about someone in love with old books and Arthurian legend, The Lost Book of the Grail connects armchair travel, yours, with Arthurian legend, mystery, romance, and evokes this nostalgia perfectly. The protagonist is a modern day Miniver Chibi. The other thing we've lost, even more important, I believe, is valuing books. Manuscripts were once so rare and valuable that they were collected in libraries where they were chained to the case. You could not take a book, you know, the chains were about this long and they're tables. So you can take the manuscript over to a table and read it, but you can't check it out for a couple of weeks. Today, however, if we don't like what a book says or have too many of them, we throw them in a trash bin or burn them. But back to Arthur. Stories of Arthur are available to us today in ways unimaginable to our grandparents or even our younger selves just starting college. Would you like to read Tennyson's original first version of The Idols of the King? Some kind person has put it up for you on the internet where you can find it at two o'clock in the morning if that's your pleasure. But the 21st century moves beyond being able to read ancient texts in your living room. Another modern addition to the wealth of sources for Arthur is film. Oop. Pick an image. While stories of Arthur proliferated over the centuries, there were few plays written featuring Arthur that were a success. Why? because the stories of Arthur are too big to put on a theater stage. There's a cast of thousands. The action moves from one part of the world to another. The modern movie, however, was the absolute perfect way to cover and show the expanse of Arthurian tales. What does it do to the story to see it taken off the page and put on the big screen. Well, often it does it quite a bit of damage. The power to change the story, as we've seen with the films over the past few weeks, is tantalizing. I was struck by this a few years ago when one of my favorite books, Lord of the Rings, was adapted for television, uh, for movies. Now. A movie does not have the time to show an entire thick book. So it needs to be edited to fit in the approximately two hour time slot. The amount of time allocated to different portions of the book thus places an emphasis on the material that the author may not have intended. Certainly with Lord of the Rings, the movie has an emphasis on war and battle that Tolkien doesn't have in his original. There is warfare in his book, but it's not the major focus. In the film, the battle scenes are privileged while the role of women and magic are marginalized. One of the problems with committing Arthurian works to the screen is that the film has to fit in a certain genre. In the case of Lord of the Rings, it's a war movie. And with the films we've seen, the story becomes a war movie or with Monty Python, a farce. But Monty Python, interestingly enough, with the unconnected scenes, the various characters who connect and disconnect, the lack of focus, becomes much more like Mallory's collection of these old tales in his Mort d'Arthur than any of the other collections or movies for that matter. 
of course, it's added more to our possibly subculture than any of the other films we've seen. If, for example, you say, I fart in your general direction, or I am one of the knights who say knee, people will either laugh because they've seen the movie or they'll look at you like you're crazy. So it's important to know your audience. Shared experiences, excuse me. Shared experiences, shared memories are what bind a culture together. A thousand years ago in medieval England, the upper class was bound together by adhering to the Christian church and the Arthurian legend. They were shared beliefs and experiences. For the peasants grubbing around in the dirt, it was pretty much the Christian church and possibly some of the tales of Arthur if a bard came through. After 14 centuries, a millennium and a half, we've seen stories of Arthur, once a warlord, then a king, then a man in decline, and what has he showed us? What does his myth give us as a takeaway? Obvious and constant throughout these tales is the canvas of the patriarchy on which the characters play themselves out. Even in the romances of courtly love, the women get their strength and power not through any sort of inherent capabilities, but because the men yield their power to women. And what about figures like Morgan? In these tales, women often wield magic, which they can use to harm or help men. And often, when they do, the men turn on them. As we saw in, again, Monty Python, what do you do with women? Witches, burn them. That was frequently the response. Patriarchy, division of power based on sex, may seem like a universal truth. I mean, doesn't everybody see the world that way? And yet there are societies like that of the Hopi that are not patriarchal, or the Navajo who do not divide along clear patriarchal matriarchal lines. For example, the men are warriors, but it's the women who control the flow of battle. Now, if you thought you were gonna get out of one of my classes without hearing my favorite quote from my favorite mythologist, Joseph Campbell, you would be mistaken. If you haven't heard this before, think about it for a minute. Myths are the stories we tell ourselves to tell us who we are. This is a storytelling doll from the Southwest. The Hopi believe stories should be told at the right time and in the right place. All people, and I believe this is universal, see the world as them and us. Even those who believe that we are, quote, all one, distinguish between those who believe that we are all one and those who don't believe it. So how does this connect to Arthur? Well, I think we've pretty well established that even if there had been a warlord named Arthur, and there may well have been, he certainly did not live from the 5th to the 12th to the 20th century. He didn't stop in the 12th century and round up a group of knights to search for the Holy Grail. But the idea of Arthur the idea that was shaped in these stories that were told about him became the real Arthur. And the real Arthur changed, as we have seen from century to century, and from what society needed or wanted 
in a national hero. So what do these stories of Arthur tell us about who we are? The stories in books and movies. Because people and societies are not monodimensional, they tell us a number of things. If we look first at some of the movies we've seen, the Disney cartoon, The Sword in the Stone, supports one of our favorite mythic themes. Even the lowliest person can rise to greatness. That goodness always wins. And the movie reminds us of many of the bits and pieces of the myth we picked up as children. Excalibur continues with the myth of the sword and the stone and the vision of pulling the sword out of the stone and brandishing it carries some very phallic imagery which continues throughout the film. The movie also reinforces our love of seeing brave men fight for the right. Not politically, just fight for that which is right. These tales have also served to shape our society. In the 19th and 20th century, books like The Boy's King Arthur reinforced children's place in the world. It was the boys and men who got, off and got to go off and have adventures, who were strong heroes and did wondrous deeds that were admired by all. While women, girls, stood by and watched, or were for the other world and tempted men. Monty Python gives us an opportunity to laugh at ourselves and laugh at the imagined English countryside as a pristine landscape knights gallop through until they come across some pesky, dirty, stinky peasants who clog up the works. Again, in this film, there are only two female characters. One who has been accused of witchcraft because she looks like a witch. And the unanimous consensus is burn her. Zook and her band of women embodied the mostly male fantasy of a group of beautiful young women grooming themselves and waiting for a man any man to come along. Camelot, which we haven't seen yet, but you probably remember, shows the Arthurian myth in all its fantasy. This image of Camelot was used by Jacqueline Kennedy in the weeks following the assassination of her husband. She used it to cloak their time in the White House with a magical tent covering everything they did with magic and a reference back to a mythical and historical greatness. Her key focus was to ensure that his legacy endured. To do that, she spun a fantasy, a glittering fairy tale about JFK's thousand days in the White House that continues to captivate our nation. She began promoting the legend in an interview with life journalist Theodore White only four days after her husband's burial. Her inspiration, JFK's favorite Broadway musical, Camelot. The story of a mythical world ruled by King Arthur where goodness reigned supreme. Stories of Arthur, the war chief turned mythic figure, are both a national myth of Britain, also deeply Christian and Celtic. As the stories continued to grow, they grew in a Christian world where wars were being fought for religious supremacy. 
and these wars are still being fought today. Stories from Mallory and others are set within the Christian calendar. The Green Knight arrives at Christmas. Another story takes place at Easter. One of the things became increasingly important in the Christian monastic world was celibacy. The Grail Knight was able to find the Grail because he was chased. And in many of these stories, a knight is placed in grave danger when faced with another world woman, as Monty Python spoofed with Zook. So what happens when a fundamentally deeply embedded myth like those in Arthurian tales runs counter to modern attempts at social change? If the myths are the stories that we tell ourselves to tell us who we are, and the myths we are telling ourselves right now today with the movies and the books, comics, these myths, stories all tell us that we are a patriarchal Christian society. These popular works work to reinforce, often at a subliminal level, that women are dangerous, seductive beings, and in order to have access to power, women have to become men, taking their role in society. I could have put up women in power suits, but I thought women warriors. The 21st century has been one of virtually constant warfare, but it has also been one in which feminism, the world of women, is demanding an equal place at the table. Women becoming warriors is one way to get a place at the table. But the Celtic part of these stories argues that women don't have to become masculine to have power. The Lady of the Lake, Morgaz, her kindred. Now, all we have to do is to figure out how women can access power without becoming either male or hated or both. Easy, right? Before we end this session on King Arthur, I'd like to turn your attention to Prince Valiant. You probably haven't thought about Prince Valiant in ages, but Prince Valiant is not only the longest running adventure strip in our newspaper, but he's our USA very own Arthurian story. Every Sunday, Prince Valiant charges throughout the medieval world, righting wrongs, facing danger, and exploring strange lands. Do you share my memory of lying on the rug in the living room and reading Prince Arthur, uh, Prince Valiant? Prince Valiant's full title is Prince Valiant in the Days of King Arthur. He came to our emotional rescue during, in 1937, during the final years of the Great Depression, with World War II obviously looming on the horizon. These were dark days in this country, and Prince Valiant showed the world beautifully drawn heroes in this American-created comic strip. Prince Valiant has a series of adventures always fighting for the right and always winning. That doesn't come across as well as I'd hoped. The setting is Arthurian. Valiant is a Nordic prince from way up north, located near present day Trondheim on the Norwegian coast. Early in his long history, he arrives at Camelot, where he becomes friends 
with Sir Gawain and Sir Tristram. Earning the respect of King Arthur and Merlin, he becomes a knight of the round table. On a Mediterranean island, Aleba, queen of the Misty Isles, he meets and later marries. He fights the Huns with his powerful swinging sword, which in a 1939 strip, a witch identifies with the legendary sword of Arthur, a magical blade created by the same enchanter. Val travels to Africa and America and later helps his father regain his lost throne. Arn gives the singing sword to Prince Valiant and Val is knighted by King Arthur and the following year he helps to restore his father to his kingdom. Moving across Britain, Europe, and the Holy Land, Val fights invading Goths, Huns, and Saxons. Many of the people we were expecting to have to fight in the coming years. Prince Valiant and King Arthur carried us through World War II, the Cold War, the Korean War, and all the other wars that have plagued 20th and 21st century, bringing us tales of valiant knights fighting to right wrongs and restore peace. In his new incarnation, Prince Valiant brings the once and future king to life in this country. In our dark days, when he was needed the most. Questions, questions. Yes, I have a question. And that is, it struck me, or maybe this is a comment that you can react to. It struck me that one of the reasons that the Arthurian myth might be so long lasting and so mutable is that it was so bare bones. It left lots of room for invention. Whereas I was comparing it myself to the Hector and Achilles of the Trojan War, that story was set even centuries probably before it was written down. And once it was written down by Homer, whoever Homer was, then there was really virtually no room for invention. That's absolutely right. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of the things that saved Arthur was the fact that these stories early on were carried orally. And if they were written down, it was one over here and one over there. There wasn't one Iliad for example, until 600 years later when Mallory came along and he scooped up a lot of these stories, not all of them, he scooped up a lot of them and plunked them into a book. And he said, you know, this is what I heard from this old French book. So that it wasn't, a, this is the way it was, but just these are the stories that I've heard. These are the stories that I've found which makes it a very different sort of thing and makes it much more possible for somebody like Hal Foster to come along and say, oh, hey, Prince Valiant, why not? Uh, because they're really, okay, backing off even farther, if you go through Mallory, just, just Mallory, and look at all the various characters, it would probably take you months to figure out that there was no Prince Valiant in Mallory. And there might have been. I mean, it might have been somebody's soubriquet. Uh, so you're absolutely right. It's that fluidity. And I think, in part, that fluidity is reinforced 
by the Celtic influence because the Celts, like the Hopi, believed that if something was really important, you should not put it on paper. You should not write it down. Just anybody might be able to get hold of it. Okay, well, I have a homework assignment for you. I'll get Will in a second. Um, and that is that in the future, since you've benefited from uh, the many permutations um, and long life of Arthur, uh, you know, set yourself the task of watching when the, you see vit vestiges of the myth appearing and in what form. So, Will, you have a question, I think. Nancy, thank you uh, for sending us back to our childhood a little bit. But uh, in your introductory comments today, you mentioned uh, attracting students from the STEM part of the campus. Yes. Uh, of course, being a sort of an academic type dean in the STEM part of the campus, I was attracted to your comment. We see a lot of that. But this was before the days of STEM, even. And uh, all I can think of is you were doing your little bit of effort toward uh, making STEM into STEAM. No, University of Maryland was very definitely divided. There were the languages and humanities on one side of campus and science and mathematics were on the other side of campus. And the campus was so big that we had five minutes passing time and there were buildings that it took, even on roller skates, seven minutes to get from one to the other. So, but I, I was using STEM as a way of not having to say, well, you know, all those sciencey nerds over there. <laughs> Do we have other questions? Thank you, Nancy. This has really been most enjoyable. Well, thank you. I've and so I want to do a quick promo. Uh, Nancy mentioned her Hopi myth course uh, in the fall semester, but she's also doing a one-shot deal on called Witches, which will be just appropriately before Halloween. So keep an eye out for that one, too. Thank you all for coming.